Thank you much, very much indeed, Dave. Um, in 1998, Oxford Archaeology and Wessex Archaeology embarked on Britain's first um, archaeological joint venture framework um, in order to provide heritage services for BAA, British Airports Authority, principally at Heathrow Terminal 5, but also other airports. And in of, of this self, itself, this was, this was quite a, a remarkable uh, achievement because since the development of PPG 16 in 1990, uh, firms that had um, worked alongside each other, had perhaps cooperated, were much more put into a context of competing with each other. And I think that threw up a certain degree of secrecy and suspicion between us. So I think an important factor of a framework was that we could show that it was possible for two commercial companies to come together and build trust um, and work on a project to deliver an important outcome. But more importantly, um, for the purposes of this discussion, it showed that, in fact, it is possible to conduct research-focused archaeology in a development context and to do it cost-effectively. These aims were very much promoted by uh, the project's consultants, Jill Andrews and John Barrett, um, and they were supported by BAA. It very, very much meshed in with the BAA ethos of investing up front in development, but expecting continuous improvement from its contractors. The size of the scheme was very large, uh, certainly very large by the standards of the 1990s. It was about 70 hectares worth of excavation. Um, and there was considerable concern at the beginning about how it was going to be possible to do the work in a, in a traditional way, with standard evaluation um, and um, then developing a strategy based on the results, etc., etc. This is a busy airport, how to fit in and slot in with a lot of other activity going on, um, but also the timescales involved. But of equal, if not more, weight was that if this work was going to be achieved um, in the standard way, the, the, the methods that were applied on sites of one or two hectares or whatever, it was going to be phenomenally expensive. Um, and the idea was to try, therefore, and um, develop an approach which Jill and John were specifically brought on board to do, which was to ensure the very best research outcome for the project, um, but at an affordable cost, at a reasonable cost uh, to the client. And the framework JV was created, um, and we tendered for the project um, based on a research strategy um, and were taken on on the basis of that research strategy. And the strategy kind of grew out of the experience of both organisations working on large, often gravel extraction sites actually, um, and an experience of working principally um, with manpower service schemes, but then as PPG 16 kicked in, there were very many um, projects which were which predated PPG 16. So uh, the government uh, was faced with some very, very complex archaeology it was obliged uh, to, uh, to look at, um, and we developed a strategy which would attempt to do that, getting the best research outcome, um, but at a reasonable price. Um, the research strategy began with a kind of statement of knowledge as we knew it um, and its aims were really developed out of that. Um, and um, <coughs> sites weren't genuinely, generally evaluated. Um, there was a quite large scale stripping and I think, you know, we look at this now and think, oh well that's sort of fairly par for the course, but actually it was absolutely huge uh, when, it was, when these sites were first stripped in the late 1990s. And then, starting with the overall site plan, um, overarching questions were asked of the landscape and its development through time. Um, questions about the character, general character of the archaeology, the chronology, looking at the individual uh, different features, um, trying to assess what they were about, trying to construct a chronological framework. And then working with that to tighten up the research aims working from what was called the landscape generic to the landscape specific um, aspects of the project. And the landscape specific aspects set out a sampling strategy which would um, very much focus on the kinds of features that would give the important information. And 
then moving down on the final level for a particular detailed excavation of some very, very important archaeology um, that needed further work. And the driver throughout was answering research questions about the site and its context and interpreting on site and creating the historical narrative as the project progressed. A crucial aspect of being able to deliver it um, was the fact um, that uh, there was a mechanism devised to actually feed information back to those in the field. And this is where development money from BAA really did um, come into its own because um, we were able to um, work with um, the specialists that we had in the two organisations to create a, a relational database uh, which would bring a lot of information about features as they're being excavated, tie that in to information being provided by specialists as the site uh, progressed, and enable those on the site to actually interrogate the information. Um, it was linked to GIS mapping, so phase plans could be produced and amended as appropriate. Um, and for its time, this relational database was, was really quite innovative. Um, nowadays, I'm sure we could, we could do this um, much more effectively. Uh, but it enabled, for example, that this, this is a, a, pho a photograph of a, um, a, a waterhole. Uh, you can see the, diff the, the site description, um, the different deposits within it, um, and where they are ranked uh, in, or in stratigraphic order. And then this shows you the number of finds coming from it and the types of finds coming from it. Um, but I think there were um, three other quite important aspects uh, to the work. One was the training of staff up front in order to enable them to um, cope with the new technology and to record sites in a slightly different way. But the other thing was that staff were actually actively encouraged in the field to interpret. And I think this is something that we're not very good at doing, especially if we've got people who are not necessarily particularly experienced. We tend to sort of shy away a little bit from this. But site staff were encouraged to um, go around, correlate what they were doing with what other people were doing. For example, are, are these fills in this ring ditch the same um, level? Were they deposited at the same time? Where are the complexities here? And they were very much engaged in the research questions but also, obviously, the input of specialists um, as material was being uh, retrieved from the field. So, in other words, um, having specialists to hand who would look at the pottery and date it, get, get some spot dating back. Um, samples were processed during the course of the excavation, feeding information back about what was producing material um, and where more work should be focused um, and where... Um, there was not very much material coming up at all. But basically, constructing the historical narrative, what was important about this landscape as, as people um, in, in encountered it? And it was really only the final l levels of interpretation that were postponed until the end. The outcomes um, were really quite a sophisticated understanding um, of the development and use of the landscape through time, how generations built on the um, achievements of previous generations, what they encountered, looking at the landscape at any one point in time, how they coped with what they, um, they found as they inhabited this landscape, and their legacy and how they redesigned what they found uh, and what they passed on to succeeding generations. And this in the context, obviously, of long-term uh, formation processes. Um, but I think also, uh, the, the, uh, this, is a, this is one of the uh, reconstruction drawings in the publication, but I think what is, is so interesting is to see how the Middle Iron Age uh, settlement actually reuses Bronze Age, the Bronze Age field systems, Bronze Age enclosure here, um, and how... Um, it was possible to, to sort of build up this, this stratigraphic pattern as the project uh, proceeded. And it was only really in the late Iron Age, early Roman period that this, this field system was, um, was cut across um, and realigned. 
But I think also uh, there, were, there were other outcomes. Obviously, the archaeological outcome um, in terms of research was important. But what it did deliver was a very highly motivated and skilled workforce. Um, and I would say that some of our best archaeologists actually came out of the framework project. They really did think about what they were doing and question what they were doing um, and engaged with the archaeology. Um, it also provided a mechanism to uh, rapidly integrate a range of material um, from um, different um, material categories, feed it back to people on site um, so that uh, they had the information to hand. But actually doing that also and, and creating the narrative also uh, enabled us to um, have a better engagement with the client and explain what we were actually finding, they could understand it, but also explain it to the public. That, um, this, this is you know, much more immediate than we're usually able to, to deliver and, and, and much more nuanced than we're able to deliver as, as a general principle. And so there's a public, for public audience, it's much more engaging, I think, and entertaining. Uh, but also there's less collection of redundant material and resources are able to be focused on the things that are actually shedding light on the archaeology of the site. It means there's less risk of actually missing important things. You know, we don't come off the site and suddenly think, oh my God, why didn't we spend much more time digging this feature or whatever? Um, but it also means that we don't recover a lot of data that we don't really find useful or need. Um, it was somewhat um, ahead of its time in some ways. And obviously there were challenges. It would be ridiculous to assume that we, this was a sort of seamless process. It just carried on um, as, as though uh, it, was, it was very, very simple. It wasn't. I mean, obviously there were IT difficulties and we were very fortunate to have some, some good IT people, but it did rely on one or two people, which I think is, w was, was a bit risky. Um, nowadays we could actually achieve much more uh, with, with technology as, as it has advanced. Um, and another difficulty really was um, the problem of running a project like this, which was on a different trajectory to the other sorts of projects that we run. We, we generally work in the field, we retrieve the information, we take it back, we do a post-excavation assessment, then we move on to the post-excavation analysis. Suddenly you've got to leave time for your specialists, your key people, to actually go on to site or to look at the material, to feed the information back. That cuts across the sort of general flow of what you're doing. Um, and it can create a certain amount of friction within organisations <coughs> when you think somebody else's project is being prioritised over yours because the specialists can't finish their report because they're down at Heathrow getting on with something else. <laughs> Some nods in the audience, Chris. You know what it's like. And I was on the receiving end of that, so I understand what it feels like. Um, um, and I think that, nevertheless, it did um, produce some strong benefits. Um, it makes archaeology more exciting, rewarding, people feel empowered on site, um, and it means that resources are targeted on the excavation of features that are shedding light on, on the past activity, and, and I've already said that, but I think uh, it's, what's important as well is this very human dimension that um, the framework ethos attempted to put into um, the interpretation of the site. So this actually is a reconstruction of people in a, in a U-shaped enclosure watching people walking down the bank barrow, the Neolithic bank barrow. Um, but the fact that this could be um, produced very quickly does, does mean that there is much more um, ability to reach out and provide good outcomes for the general public. The human story is something that the outside world understands very well and actually the client understands is our experience. Since T5, since T5, I can persuade it to move on, <laughs> we're stuck on T5 I'm afraid, I'm assuming that it, oh, there we go. Um, since T5 both organisations have gone on to undertake hybrid versions of framework, both together and separately. This is a gravel extraction site at Hawcott in Gloucestershire, where we attempted to undertake the same approach, very large site, very complex archaeology. Um, and it, it does work. 
Um, but actually, it's quite hard to carry on doing that. And we somehow, I think, um, have failed to push this um, method of, of proceeding through archaeological excavation forward. Um, I do uh, worry about the legacy of the T5 project. And um, in the light of, of the National Planning Policy Framework in, in 2012, this is really far, rather unfortunate because, I mean, that does focus much more on, on knowledge and understanding and much less on the recording of, of archaeological features. So we should be moving much more towards this. But actually, it, my experience at least, is that very, very little has changed since NPPF. Um, and we're still quite fixed in a PPG-16 world, I suggest. So why is this? Well, I think part of it is, is just inertia. I mean, it's much, much easier to carry on doing it as we've always done it. That's how our structures are set up. Um, this is how um, we, we've delivered our projects. It doesn't fail exactly. Um, so we just carry on doing the same thing. Uh, and that's partly tied into lack of time and money uh, to develop the strategies and to develop the, the, the uh, technology to deal with it. But short lead-in times... Um, tight schedules, it's just very much easier to revert to what we know and what, what is easy to deliver for us. But it's also a problem of prescriptive uh, written schemes of investigation and briefs, I think. And these are largely written, of course, by hard-pressed curatorial staff, perhaps consultants, um, of, and there are fewer of, of these uh, consult uh, cur curators around uh, they're more high hard pressed they they're actually dealing with larger numbers of planning applications if they exist at all and of course in some parts of the country there are few curators full stop um, and they have diminishing su support from their local government services um, which are hard pressed for cash and also diminishing report, uh, support from central government which is chipping away at our legislation um, which, which supports their positions. And they have little enough time to monitor as it is without additionally having to provide some input into research designs and, and uh, seeing how these change through time and, and agreeing them uh, these changes as people go along. So for them, dealing with those kinds of projects is much harder work. Um, and I think that therefore it's easier to just go back to the, we'll dig 20% of this feature and 50% of that feature. Uh, and I think that that is um, somehow just, just sort of simpler. Uh, it's sort of going back to, to sort of what we can do. Uh, but I think there is another big issue, and that is a lack of trust that exists. And it's partly a lack of trust between commercial organisations and curators. Can a curator really trust the archaeological company when they say, we've done enough of this feature, um, you know, we've learned all there is to know about it, and there actually is no value in continuing to put our resources into excavating more of it? Um, why would they believe them? Are they actually trying to cut corners? Um, I think that that is a difficult issue that needs to be addressed, but I think that it's one that... Um, Heathrow showed that it was possible to overcome that. But the other is a lack of trust between clients and, and commercial companies. How can we trust these people if we give them some, it looks like a sort of open checkbook really, to go out onto site um, and to, uh, how, we, how do we know they're not going to overspend or overstay? You know, they, clients want certainty um, and that is quite difficult sometimes to achieve. The way that um, Framework uh, delivered that partly was because, um, because of the BAA setup um, and the way that they created project teams um, in which um, the consultants were uh, brought on board very early and the contractors were brought on board early. And the contractors helped to form part of the discussion about project budgets, individual budgets for sites. Uh, based on previous experience, obviously. And they worked with the consultants, with British, with BAA, with the, you know, the overall client, but also with programmers and with other people, such as plant company and so on, to form a kind of team uh, which was responsible for delivering the archaeological project. 
um, and they set up the budgets, which had which had risks attached to it, but also opportunities. And I think by opportunities it means areas where we can cut the costs. Um, and um, these, these were what, what was called a task team execution. They formed a task te team execution plan, which sounds a bit painful, really. Um, but um, I, I think that that was a, a, an important feature of it. And I think it's worth saying that T5 was a project which was delivered to time and to budget overall. Um, and the overall costs, archaeological costs, I, I'm afraid I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I think that they were um, reasonable for the proportion of, of development work that went on. <coughs> infrastructure projects, oh look, there's a train. <laughs> infrastructure projects have the potential, I think, to overcome some of the hurdles that ordinary projects um, would have um, to, to overcome in order to deliver field work. Um, and that is to, um, they have the power to think in advance and to think more strategically about what they're trying to deliver. Um, and they also have to demonstrate public benefit. So I think they really are a good context in which to develop these methods of working um, more, uh, more fully. So what would I say were the uh, overall lessons for framework? I, I would say actually planning an investment in advance was absolutely crucial um, because much th thought and time and money had gone into thinking about what the overall plan was, what the research aims were, how it was going to be delivered. And then when it came to execution stage, it was much more cost effective. The focus on the aims and gaining knowledge, um, because that's actually what we're about, um, and I think that that gave it a clear driver all the way through, a very clear focus on what they were trying to deliver. Investment in technology, um, I think, was absolutely essential, because I think that information needed to be feed, fed back very, very quickly. People on site need to make difficult decisions. What do we know about and what do we need to know more about? Um, and they need that information quickly and speedily. Um, and it's quite hard, actually, for organisations on tight budgets to actually have the, the money to invest as much as they would like in developing these things, even if we know it will save us money and time in the long run. Developing a dialogue and collaboration was absolutely crucial. Um, I think, you know, working in collaboration is good, and I think the earlier the conversation is between, um, between the clients, the consultants, and the contractors together, to come together to deliver a joint shared project, a shared goal, then the more successful it's likely to be. Um, and also, you know, bringing in universities and external specialists, everybody who actually comes together to form um, a research project, because in this, in fact, is, is what it is. Um, and at the best, I think these um, partnerships create unique working environments uh, which encourage creativity um, as well as advancing knowledge. But they also are able to demonstrate public value, and I think this is, this is what's so important, because telling the story is what people get, um, and that's what we should be doing. So... Thank you very much indeed. Yeah.